You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Brian Callen Show, which once again will not be featuring Brian Callen because he's a huge star and apparently is needed by some sort of major television network to film something, um, which is great as far as I'm concerned because it means that I get today's guest all to myself. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce Jeff Hobbs, who is the author of The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace, a book that I've talked before about on the podcast. And uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Hunter. Really, really appreciate it. So w- tell us a little bit about this book. Tell us about who was Rob Peace. Uh, so Rob was, a uh, uh, he was my randomly paired freshman roommate uh, at, at Yale. Um, met him in a uh, barely furnished room uh, and sort of the, the melee of move-in day. Um, uh, at the time, I knew just from some light correspondence that he had gone to prep school and he uh, played water polo. Uh, he enjoyed hiking the Appalachian Trail. So I assume that aside from being uh, black, that he was a pretty typical Yale freshman. Uh, a progressive person might ask if there uh, is such a thing, and, and I can guarantee you that that uh, there is. You're, you're sitting here with one. <laughs> um, um, but Rob was not typical, um, and uh, we can talk about why it wasn't just because he grew up the hard way uh, in inner city uh, Newark, New Jersey, um, right right outside of Newark, New Jersey, in a, in a township called uh, Orange, um, and that, that his father was in prison for, for a double homicide since Rob was seven years old. But, um, uh, you know, I, I say he wasn't typical uh, because... He was a straight A student of molecular biophysics and biochemistry, and uh, it's about as easy as as it sounds. <laughs> um, captain of the water polo team, uh, just bright and uh, uh, popular, uh, very good guy, and uh, um, you know the last person you would expect to uh, be murdered over dealing drugs uh, back home in Orange. Right. So here's the here's the great tension of sort of Rob's life, and it's a great tension that you know is playing out all across America and all across the world. But, you know, we're going to look at Rob Peace as an example of that, where you have this kid who's clearly brilliant. He gets into Yale. He graduates with a degree in molecular biophysics. So clearly a very, very smart guy, clearly knows how to do well in school. But at the same time, you know, he ends up back in Newark, New Jersey, ends up dealing drugs and ends up dying in a drug shootout. And the question is why? Because the the myth that has sort of often been propagated is that education is enough, that if you give kids a good education, then they get out of these tough circumstances. It's the great equalizer. And Rob's piece's story would seem to suggest that, no, that's not enough. There's more to the equation, right? Um, for sure. Um, and if you're talking about education, uh, Rob's mother, who worked in hospital kitchens, um, and I, I can't say enough good things about her. I just spoke to her the other day, in fact. Um, but but she sent him to a amazing prep school in downtown Newark called St. Benedict's mm-hmm. uh, Prep, where, again, he, he was a star. He was leader of the student body, um, great athlete, and uh, um, on to Yale, uh, where, where, again, he... he, he thrived there um, mm-hmm. and it's easy to uh, uh, look back at the story in, in retrospect and uh, sort of blame Yale a lot of a lot of people uh, want me to do that but um, you know it's more it's more complicated than that um, and it, it had to do with blueprints I think and, and especially if you're talking about education most structures lay out very particular blueprints um, for instance molecular biophysics and biochemistry major uh, you, you pretty much have to go to grad school, and, and you're either going to uh, become a professor or a researcher or, or a doctor, of course. Um, and, and Rob, just from very early on in his life, uh, kind of detested the whole idea of blueprints. So uh, uh, I think that's where a lot of it starts. Well, I, you know, I'm reminded of a, a guest a, f- a few uh, months ago brought up a James Baldwin quote that I think is really relevant here, which is, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. And obviously that applies to Yale, that applies to Rob, that applies to, you know, the two of us sitting right here. There are these great historical forces, these experiences that are driving our choices without even re- 
realizing it. Their racism is largely unconscious. It's not that people sit around and, you know, deliberately teach racism to their kids. They just sort of pick it up emotionally because they see, oh, when we're around black people, we get scared and defensive and protective. Mm -hmm. And then that drives their choices. And, you know, Yale, it's not that Yale is sitting there maliciously, deliberately trying to create a system that doesn't help acculturate or include or, you know, help Rob deal with, you know, the, the baggage of his past, right? Mm -hmm. They're just unconsciously driven by a history. It's an old institution. It's been around for a long time. And the same thing is true with the culture that, you know, Rob picked up growing in Newark. You know, and some of that, I mean, you know, the example that I always use is talking about, you know, it's like our parents. We all know that we pick up good things and bad things from our parents. And then the great challenge of our lives is to sort through that and realize, oh, this was helpful, this thing I got from my mom. Oh, but this thing is probably a little unhealthy, <laughs> right? Um. So. Yeah, so I mean, I think, and you know, the 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 rule of thumb that we often use on this po podcast is Hanlon's razor. So everybody knows Occam, ra Occam, Occam's razor. Every, all things being equal, the simplest explanation is the truth. Hanlon's razor is that never attribute attribute to malice what can be credited to stupidity. <laughs> so it's not that Yale is malicious or that mm -hmm. you know uh, any of these other institutions are malicious. They're just very often unconsciously controlled by that history that James Baldwin is talking about. Mm -hmm. um. No, it's funny you 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 mentioned that. Uh, I was speaking to a group once, and uh -huh. uh, 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 a woman asked a question about uh, Rob, and she was asking if you know drugs and drug culture were normal to him because mm -hmm. of because of how and where he grew up. Um, and you know, normal is one of those words that that means very different things. Um, uh, uh, same as success and and potential words that uh, uh, just have d different meanings uh, in different cultures and. I mean, I, I said that my, uh, you know, my parents are very normal to me. My in-laws are very not normal to me. Mm -hmm. uh, to my wife, her in-laws are very normal. Uh, mine, not so much. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, like you said, it, it's a simple sort of construct in, in our culture. Um, and when you talk about race and class, especially in, in college, for instance, uh, I mean, I remember uh, being very glad to have a black, roommate um the opposite of scared uh, i uh, at the time thought i was pretty savvy when it came to black culture uh, this is because i ran track in in high school uh, and then you know traveled with uh with my uh sprinter teammates we played spades and i thought i was uh down which um <laughs> like, Rob never, Rob never, uh, Rob never informed me. Otherwise, I, I think more out of <laughs> which is very gracious of Rob to think, Rob's credit. I, I think it was more out of amusement than, a, than <laughs> graciousness. But so yeah, so there's you know, I mean, that's the thing. So uh, just to sort of start off, I think part of you know what the book really does so well in the beginning is really set up that you know there are his mom and his dad which are obviously huge influences in all of our lives. And so, as you said, his mom, very hardworking, really doing everything she can to provide her son with a better life, paying for prep school, all of these sorts of things. And then there's his dad, who simultaneously is, you know, and the, the things that I took away from it are simultaneously is really encouraging him academically, really values that, you know, would sit with him and do homework with him. But at the same time was taking him out on the streets and sort of showing him around and getting him to know the layout of the neighborhood. So it's really sort of these two worlds that Rob is trying to reconcile. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he did reconcile them in, in his own mind. Um, uh, like you said, his dad, very fierce intellect that's the first thing anybody ever uh, says about him um but uh that was paired with with a really uh immense curiosity about people and, mm -hmm. and I, I think rob sort of grabbed both of those qualities and and i mean that that was rob the first thing anybody ever said about him is that that curious about people if, if you had a story uh, he wanted to hear it mm -hmm. um he, he wanted to laugh um call you an idiot if, if you were acting like one. Um, but he, he would also tell you if he was proud of you, which is very rare for a man, and particularly a, uh, a young man. Um, but uh, the thing is that he very rarely ever shared his own story, mm -hmm. um, especially talking about his father, even with his closest friends from growing up back home, um, friends who were present in the house the, the night he was killed. Um, yeah, and so uh, what I thought was interesting, though, is, is that although he's being encouraged 
into, you know, really getting an education. At the same time, there was a line that really jumped out to me about the idea that, you know, of being uppity, that this was an, uh, this was sort of, on the other hand, sort of a barrier to him. There, there wa it wasn't necessarily a raw reward, right? So if we, if we talk about cultures, you know, I mean, in some cultures, education is seen as an unequivocal good. The more of it, the better. But there is some sort of conflict there, and this becomes a conflict much later in Rob's life, where on the one hand, he values education and acquires it, but simultaneously, has to downplay his educational accomplishments. Him having gone to Yale when he goes back to Newark becomes a real liability. And so he has to sort of play the role as if, oh, there's nothing special about him educationally. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I always wonder, um, uh, Rob's father went to prison when Rob was seven and died in prison when Rob was uh, 26 of, of brain cancer uh, in between Rob uh, uh Starting at age 13, you know, just invested so much of his spirit, so much of his time to preying his father. He firmly believed he was innocent. Um, and, you know, all the hundreds of hours of talking they did through the plexiglass and mostly in New Jersey State Prison, um, you know, no one will ever know what they said to each other. I bet they talked a lot about Giants football mm -hmm. and, and music, but um, I bet they talked a lot about manhood, too, and, and what it means to be a man. And I wonder what his father's reaction was when Rob uh, told him in 1998 that he was going to Yale and that a uh, rich white banker alumni of his high school was going to uh, to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's like a tremendous moment in, in the story, um, a generous moment. Uh, Rob crying, uh, this banker telling him he can go to school wherever he, want, he wants. But uh, I, I imagine for his father, it, it was more complicated than that. Yeah, there, and that's the point is, is that there are these complex feelings. And that's, I mean, that's so much of what culture is, is, is that we've picked up these. I mean, as I read your book, the book that I kept on thinking about, um, and I don't know if you've read it, but J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, I have not come it's, across that one. It's, it's, it's you know, like your book, uh, one of those books that's really hot right now, which, by the way, if you go on to Jeff's Amazon page, it's kind of the Amazon page that, you know, really creates author envy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's, like, a massive number of customer reviews. They're all massively positive. And then, uh, <laughs> then you know, every sort of, you know, I mean, the, that's the sort of the amazing thing is, is that, you know, there are a lot of these books that we have on here, and it's sort of like, oh, people like the New York Times really like this book. And then there are other books that are sort of much more O Magazine books. But I mean, you know, you've got everyone here. <laughs> everyone loves your book. It's really staggering. Uh, you're, you're very nice. I don't, I don't well, it's I... just, it's evidence. <laughs> like, you can look at the page yourself. Uh, and there it is. Uh, I don't think anybody would be envious of my life chasing around two kids uh, all the well, time. <laughs> <laughs> they may not be envious of the reality of your life, but the, <laughs> but the mythology of your life, the outward presentation is pretty impressive. Um, Thank you. But anyway, J.D. Vance's book, so it's a book called Hillbilly Elegy, um, and it's J.D. Vance talking about growing up as a hillbilly. Um, you know, he didn't grow up in Western Virginia, but, you know, like so many people who, you know, who originally started out in Appalachia, his family had migrated to Ohio and they worked in the Rust Belt and all that sort of stuff. And it's a real examination of essentially how does, what is hillbilly culture about and how does that serve as an obstacle um, to many of them succeed? So, you know, there's a lot of violence uh, and there's, you know, not a high value of education, right? He talks specifically about how doing well in school was considered girly, wasn't masculine. Um, and the the interesting thing is to connect it to another book, because one of the things that we've really been doing on this podcast is what we're calling mixed mental arts, where we're essentially taking all these different books and all these different disciplines and seeing how they fit together. But one of the one of you know our all time favorite guests is Richard Nisbet, and he studies culture, and he wrote this book called The Culture of Honor. And essentially, there are these honor cultures that exist all over the world, um, you know, that have honor killings and all that sort of stuff, and they all are originally originally herding cultures. So the Scots-Irish who became the hillbillies were originally uh, herders in the north of Scotland. The Arab culture is an honor culture because they are originally herders. And it essentially all comes down to the fact that as a herder, you don't have good property rights. And so, you know, I can come and t take your sheep or your goats or your camels, and I can mix them in with my sheep, goats, and camels, and you have no way to prove that they ever belong to you. So how do I defend my property? I establish a reputation as a guy you don't fuck with. Right. I establish a rep. 
Um, and essentially what happened was is that the that same hillbilly sort of redneck Scots-Irish culture was then picked up by African Americans. Originally, the African cultures, they're mostly agricultural, so they weren't honor cultures. But when you rob a people of their culture, they pick up the culture of the people around them. And so if you look at the Arab culture, the hillbilly culture, and the Arab culture, they all have this really strong sense of honor, respect, a reputation, and all that sort of stuff, and a willingness to use extreme violence to maintain and build that reputation. Um, so it was, it was very interesting to see the short and tragic life of Robert Peace in parallel with Hillbilly Elegy, because these are these two books that are coming out at very much the same time that are talking about these cultures that you know, all that do a much better job of providing community and belonging than sort of blank Anglo white culture, right? They're much more warm, they're much more affectionate, they're much more all of these things. But at the same time, there are educational consequences and there are, you know, the tendency to die in violent ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I should, I guess, specify uh, sort of what happened after he graduated yeah. Yale briefly. Because um, it, it has a lot to do with that. He, Rob was not violent. He, he was mm -hmm. definitely not. I mean, at Yale, he could be kind of a tough guy uh, just because mm -hmm. how he looked. But, uh, you know, back home, he, he was a nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, and he took a lot of pride in, in being a nerd. Um, um, I, if you had to put a label to, to you know, Rob's individual culture, I, I would uh, probably start with loyalty. Um, mm -hmm. um, what, what was very important to him and, and to his friends and, and especially to his mother is why he wanted to uh, be around them very simply. But um, So he graduated from Yale in 2002, and uh, he, he uh, sort of punted grad school. Um, he had saved up uh, about $100,000 selling marijuana, again, to uh, classmates with, with, yeah. uh, with a lot of free time and a lot of uh, free money. <laughs> um, so he, he took advantage uh, and, of that. And, and by the way, I mean, I think one of the things you drew out in the book was just that of the, all the places to be a drug dealer, Yale may be one of the best places to have that job, right? Um, yeah, treat, treated him pretty, pretty well. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, there's the confluence of people who don't know what good marijuana is and have a lot of disposable income and, you know, very limited access. For <laughs> people wanting to fit in and, and yeah. all, all, all those things and, and such an enclosed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, environment. And, and again, Rob, Rob did pretty well for himself. Uh, he, he wasn't quiet about it. I mean, again, we lived in the same uh, pretty small space for, mm -hmm. for four years together. And, uh, uh, you know, it never really struck me, certainly didn't bother me. Uh, was not a part of my life just because just I was like a very dorky uh, track runner again. Um, <laughs> but, you know, people came in, they, they downloaded, seemed to have fun, and it seemed like something he could do. Uh, maybe even needed to do, and because you're talking about marijuana in a college dorm, it seemed uh, uh, at the very least safe. Mm -hmm. um, not not so much in other environments. Mm -hmm. um, so so Rob went home from Yale, and and he went to Rio, which was a lifelong dream. Uh, he, he lost uh, most of the money that he'd saved that that was intended for. Uh, his first year of, of grad school. And, well, and how specifically did he lose it? Um, stolen, basically, by a uh, by a family member um, whom he forgave very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. a after that, he taught at his high school. What was a, uh, maybe it wasn't a calling for him, but, but right. he, he taught, you know, biology at, at St. Benedict's Prep. And did it very um, well. Very good at it. Um, and then his father died in in 2006, after he'd been teaching about four years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's when, especially his colleagues at the school, um, said that uh, you know, they just started to see a lot of uh, friction sort of regarding life purpose and, and maybe what he saw as a failure to save his father uh, from, from prison. Um, and that's maybe where, I guess you could use the word drift. It's probably more complicated than that, but um, um, that's when he, he quit teaching high school, um, he sort of struck out at local real estate, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, he, he had sort of grand ideas about uh, just sort of making the blocks better by acquiring property, uh, again, the blocks where, where he grew up. Um, and uh, it, it seemed like he did decide he wanted to go back to that blueprint and go to grad school um, and uh, opportunity, a lot of marijuana. Um, with his friends came up that uh, um, you know five young men sitting around a table whether they're 
in a kitchen any storage or a conference room above Wall Street talking about money, uh, they're, they're not often going to make the uh, wisest choice. Um, and, and, well, uh, and I think the interesting thing, too, is, is that, I mean, Rob, you know, responds to this as well by bringing in his amazing, you know, biological training and, you know, starts creating this incredible weed, right? Because he's distilling out the THC and all that sort of stuff and fortifying it. So, I mean, again, I think what I'm reminded of as well is we had Freeway Rick Ross on here, um, who, oh, wow. yeah, who <laughs> pretty much, you know, takes takes a lot of and probably deserves it uh credit for you know really promoting crack cocaine um, yeah uh, i saw the documentary uh, freeway crack in the yeah. system and you know i mean i think there's a lot of parallels there between you know rob and freeway rick bross where you have two guys who are clearly brilliant clearly entrepreneurial but you know for you know freeway rick ross sort of dropped out of the mainstream system much earlier he uh did Ten, he played tennis very well and was on track to get a tennis scholarship to college, but couldn't read. So he never made it to college. But again, you know, there's that human ingenuity that comes out. And so within the opportunities that he has available to him, he's resourceful and he invents ways to succeed. Um, but the, you know, the failures of the system to provide, you know, mechanisms and paths really for him to succeed within the system so rather than having him succeed outside of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a very troubling thing here. Um, especially when you talk about potential, is that the, uh, you know, I mean, the system did work for Rob. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, senior year of college, he was working in a med school lab with a mm -hmm. very famous scientist who, uh, you know, taken him under his wing. So uh, I think he could have gotten any fellowship he wanted. Um, but uh, again, for, for very personal, internal reasons, uh, uh you know, re rebelled against him. Um, well, I think the system worked in one sense. I mm -hmm. think in another sense, though, I mean, we have a culture, we have a culture that doesn't take culture seriously. You mm -hmm. know, it's very, America is very weird. Uh, you know, if you look at the way that education is usually discussed, you, you know, you have the sort of the democratic consensus and the democratic consensus is, oh, you know, it's a resource problem. We just need to spend enough money and get enough iPads in there and all of that sort of stuff. And then you have the sort of the Republican version and the Republican version tends to focus on, oh, we need school vouchers and all of that sort of stuff. But at no point are we really sort of looking at culture. What what values and beliefs have pick, people picked up? Do they serve their success? Do they serve their choices? And the reality is, is that the experience of someone like Rob or the experience of someone like J.D. Vance is, is that you're leaving a tribe and you're trying to join a new tribe. And I think part of what I found interesting was Rob's friends who came from a similar background mm -hmm. who reacted very differently to Rob dealing in college. And I can't remember his name, but the... Who was uh, Oswaldo. Oswaldo, I'm yeah. So t t tell us about Oswaldo, because sure. he has this very different reaction to Rob's behavior. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would maybe start answering this by saying that uh, the message of this book is, is definitely not that, you know, anyone who sort of grew up the way Rob grew up or looks the way Rob looked uh, uh, shouldn't go to college or is, is mm -hmm. going to experience the, the, the particular struggles that Rob experienced. Um, you know, I mean, in researching this, I spoke to many dozens of, uh, of our classmates who, who shared similar threads, uh, poverty or, or uh, broken homes or just the stress of the, uh, of the city. Um, and they're all living wonderful lives mm -hmm. now. They all have jobs they like and own homes and have families, um, and living very wonderfully. Um, but once we, once we started talking uh, about Rob and, and these things came up, every single one of these people, guys, girls, um, began to express this trauma of isolation that uh, that still trails them now 15 years after college. And, and a lot of grown men wept you know thinking about it um and oswaldo was one of them he uh he grew up in newark as well uh, he's puerto rican heritage uh, very poor his his uh, uncle was sort of deep into gangs and, and drugs um so you know he, he grew up with that um and he actually struggled much more than rob in college mm -hmm. uh, and actually had a total psychological breakdown that landed him in a in a white room at the uh at the Yale psych ward. Um, and, you know, most people thought Rob was really cool that he, you know, was a nerd, but, but also did, did the marijuana and smoked a lot of marijuana. And, um, 
you know, as Waldo's refrain, what was that? I don't understand how someone could be so fucking smart, but so fucking dumb. Um, and, and really, as Waldo was the only person in Rob's life who kind of gave it to him straight, uh, consistently throughout, right. um, whereas someone like me, because he'd grown up hard, I felt like I wasn't qualified to mm-hmm. give him advice. And, and even his best friends back home, uh, felt like they couldn't give him advice because he was this brilliant guy who'd gone to Yale. Right. And so, you know, Oswaldo, I mean, and I think this this sort of gets to a lot of the, the core issue with talking about culture right now is, is that, yeah, there are people who either don't feel qualified talking about it because they're white. There's the historical privilege that comes with that. There's all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's massively <laughs> uncomfortable. And but what we're really talking about is we're talking about, you know, part of just being human. Right. Part of being human is, is that there are laws and, you know, you have these great opportunities. And also, Rob, you've studied so hard and worked so hard and you're clearly brilliant. So why the hell are you dealing drugs? Like, I understand this is easy cash, but you have the potential to really screw up what is a good thing. And that was essentially Oswaldo's perspective is Mm -hmm. how can somebody who's so smart be so dumb? Um, and, you know, and Oswaldo, I mean, is not I mean, clearly didn't succeed in getting through to Rob. And there's, I mean, there's some heart. I mean, I remember towards the end of the book, right? Uh, Rob needs some money, and it's, he needs money to basically buy a, that large consignment of marijuana that ultimately proves his undoing. Mm-hmm. Um, and he ends up going to Oswaldo for the money, and Oswaldo gives him the money, but then basically cuts Rob off from his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, that that, that was an important moment, and um, and uh, Oswaldo was so ma- amazing in the in the writing of. This book, um, just so generous and, and even, you know, going back to moments like those that for him caused tremendous guilt. But, mm-hmm. um, um, but at the same time, he knows that Rob would have gotten that $4,000 some way or, or another. Um, but uh, yeah, with him, I remember we, we were driving around. Uh, he was showing me some sites uh, in, in the area. And at the time, it was sort of early on, and, and I didn't really know what I was doing and, and if it was appropriate for me to sort of be writing Rob's story. Uh, all very valid questions that I, that I still struggle with, but um, Oswaldo, uh, so I, I was just kind of blabbering and, you know, is this okay? How do you feel about this? And we stopped at a light, and he was like, Jeff, shut up. Uh, I can't give you... Uh, absolution or permission, uh, I can help you understand. Um, so if you want me to do that, then, y- you know, stop with your whining and, and uh, let's do it. And would it, let's talk about that absolution and permission. Let's talk about some of the blowback that you've had. I mean, you know, you're a white dude and you have this roommate who's black who dies and then you profit from his story. Um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's all. <laughs> so, what, what are what are those true. feelings? What are the what is the blowback that you've gotten? Because ultimately, I mean, for for me, you know, what what this book does is is that you know, I mean, firstly, you know, I think that culture is the elephant in the room for humanity. It is this big force. It is this big effect, and we've avoided talking about it essentially since World War II because of all of the disaster of you know not respecting each other's culture that came out of World War II. Um, and we need people like J.D. Vance and we need people like you to tell that story. And, you know, I think if if you hadn't told Rob's story, I don't think Rob's story would have been told. And if his, if, you know, his death ends up being something that ultimately gives humanity something to talk around um, so that we can start to figure out these issues, I think there, I couldn't imagine a better legacy for Rob. Um, well, that's very nice. And, and I hope so. Um and, you know, when I started, it, it was maybe six months after the funeral. And I, I just wanted to write like a thousand word little piece in the Yale alumni magazine or, or something that spoke more to his you know, humor and, and generosity and, and loyalty um, than did the news articles that just sort of took Yale drugs murder and uh, just sort of left it at that. Mm-hmm. Sensationalized. Sensation, yeah. yeah. Banner. Um, and... You know, so I talked to his mom about it. She, she said, uh, she said, okay. Um, and I thought I would just talk to, you know, six or 10 family and friends from Yale and, and from home. Um, and then everyone I spoke to 
referred me to six or ten more people. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Rob worked at the airport with, with this guy or mm-hmm. messed with this girl once. You should go talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> um, my cousin used to hang out with him. Uh, so six to ten turns into 90 or, or mm-hmm. 100 people uh, pretty fast. Um, uh, so then I, I was very much in over my head, but but especially stuff about his father w- was coming up and, and just very just deeply emotional uh, mm-hmm. moments w- with people um, that, uh, I, again, I, I, I struggled with uh, the fact that I look the way I look and I come from where I come from. But uh, y- you mentioned blowback, and I was worried more about blowback from Rob's friends and family when I knocked on their door. Um, mm-hmm. And I was just very struck by the way people just always open the door and, and they wanted to tell their stories. They wanted to tell Rob's stories and, and the fact that it was a very sort of awkward white guy sitting um, <laughs> in, in their living room with them listening to the story. Uh, I, I think it just mattered to them that somebody was was listening. And um, um, and again, it's been very special uh, since, since the book came out and um, especially uh, visiting schools and, and mm-hmm. seeing sort of the some kind of positive message that uh, young people particularly young men, uh, particularly young black men can sort of take take out of it. Well, and that's the thing. So have you gotten a lot of blowback? Have people given you crap, essentially, about being a white dude? Uh, <laughs> here and there. Yeah. Um, so, some, some chatter. Uh, um, you know, typically anonymous on, on Amazon uh, or, or well, something. Well, if you're going to say uh, something about it, definitely, you know, just hide behind a no, firewall. Again, it, it's, it's, all, uh, it's, all, it's all very valid. Um, well, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, I think that's, that's sort of the issue. I mean, the, the, and so, you know, Katie O'Brien, who I wrote my first book with and who, you know, you're going to meet and I'm excited for you to meet, but the analogy that we keep on using for this moment in world history is that it's humanity's first family dinner. You know, (laughs) we've all sort of been avoiding each other for millennia, right? Off in our little corners. And suddenly all these cultures are at the same table and we're sort of like appalled by these people that are apparently our relatives. Like who do what do they believe? What do they think? Oh my God, their table manners are so weird. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's all very odd and awkward, but it's, it's, uh, it's funny. I I was visiting a, uh, a school called Hampton University, mm-hmm. which is a HBCU in uh, in Virginia, um, and you could probably tell I'm not uh, never meant to be a public speaker. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it was very nice of them to to have me and about a thousand kids in a beautiful auditorium where Booker T. Washington had, had spoken and all these things. Um, but uh, I want to talk about uncomfortable. Um, me talking about race and class at a uh, Hampton University is is a uh, is uncomfortable, uncomfortable. But uh, I mean, w- one thing I've learned is that it's okay to be uncomfortable and it's necessary. But uh, I- I'm thinking of a moment where I kept saying, telling the story, and then some of the themes I kept sort of stumbling over African American, African American, <laughs> um, and, and a kid in the front row uh, sort of leaned forward and said, "Like, dude, it's okay to say black." <laughs> Um, um, so yeah but that's I mean that's it's a family dinner and that's the point we need those awkward moments and then we need to just you know keep you know slowly working our way through it but you know the one thing that is certain is is that if we don't have the conversation if we don't deal with the awkwardness then we're never going to get anywhere so you know I mean the Sally Cohn has this concept of emotional correctness um, which is I think you know actually really useful Right. Rather than political correctness, you know, we can please speech all day. We want. Do you say African-American or do you say black? But if you think about actually a family dinner, what you're actually policing is, are you being a condescending asshole? Are you being arrogant or are you really like doing your best to figure this thing out with me? And if you're coming from a sort of a genuine, sincere place of like wanting to figure things out, then, you know, as as Sally says, like you can say the most fucked up shit that you want. You know, and I think that's that's really what we have to deal with is the reality is that we've all picked up things from our parents and our parents picked up things from their parents and on and on back. And, you know, many of these the amazing thing about interviewing people like you and all these other academics is that many of these cultural forces are 10,000 years old. Sexism is 10,000 years old. It goes back to the rise of agriculture. Um, 
you know, racism is hundreds of years old and shouting at each other about it hasn't really <laughs> moved us far in terms of, you know, the underlying belief, right? Obviously, we've changed the legislation, but fundamentally, there are still a lot of racist people in the world. And in the same way, you know, these honor cultures, the, you know, the hillbilly culture or the Scots-Irish culture, the Arab culture, and then, you know, the urban African-American culture, you know, there's still honor cultures. And that has good sides. I mean, honor cultures are in general uh, incredibly hospitable. The Arabs are some of the most hospitable people you'll meet. You know, African Americans, you know, Southerners, same thing. Southern hospitality is famous the world over for a reason. Um, and, you know, that's great. But there are other consequences, like violence. So, uh, yeah. We, we, I think, no, that's, a, that's everything right Yeah. There. I mean, I think that's the point. It's awkward. It's going to be awkward, any family dinner. But, like, I, you know, I think that people like you who are willing to, like, you mm -hmm. know, okay, this is awkward, but here's something for everybody to consider. And that's really, mm -hmm. that's what's so great about the book is, you know, it's so easy to like, there's so many books that are obviously have been written about the African-American experience by white people, right? But they're usually these sort of high level statistical things. And like, I can't relate to that emotionally, but I can. Uh, sure. I can relate to Rob 100%. It's, a, it's an amazing story. Yeah. And, and I mean, t to me, maybe... Uh, you know, you, you just spoke very eloquently about, about these sort of macro ancient um, afflictions we, we mm -hmm. all carry. And, um, uh, you know, any way to sort of connect or marry those to, uh, you know, again, the deep interior that, that we all uh, so, sort of have. Uh, and I mean, that's where the, the connections happen. Because, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can talk academically uh, um, all day and all week long, mm -hmm. um, but but sort of understanding people in like a low key, quiet way. Um, and I mean, the neat thing about having told this story is, is sort of hearing the stories of, of so many other people. Uh, and again, mostly students uh, from Ivy League schools to juvenile halls, and, and uh, almost every space in, in between. And uh, I mean, one moment uh, I was in a really neat charter school in uh, southeastern Washington, mm -hmm. uh, D.C., and, uh, you know, just in the library, sort of chatting with small group guys and girls, um, and talking about Rob and this young man, maybe 16, stood up, and, uh, and you know, it's a very brave thing to be 16, year olds and 16 years old and stand up uh, and be vulnerable, um, mm -hmm. especially in front of girls. Um, and, you know, he, he just said that uh, uh, there's sort of like the big part of him that he can sort of share with uh with with his teachers and and his neighbors and and people and there's this smaller uh section of his chest that is uh only shared with him and his mother mm. uh, and then there's a smaller section than that that is just between him and his closest friends uh, and then he said there's this little box and uh I mean, I'm quoting very badly, but uh, he just said there's this box in his chest and it's locked and he doesn't even know what's in it and mm. uh, um, doesn't know how to open it, but but sort of really wants to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess that that's sort of what, what, what the, the purpose was. What was Well, exactly. Box, uh, you know, yeah, Rob certainly had one. I mean, that's the point. I mean, there's so much we all carry, you know, stuff within us and the opportunity to talk it out. And I mean, you know, I think cause so much of it is, let's be honest, like who has power nowadays? It's the big data crowd. It's Silicon Valley. It's all that sort of stuff. And, you know, they think that you can run society entirely by a numbers. But, you know, after a war, what's effective? It's truth and reconciliation. You get a bunch of people around in a circle in that old tribal way, and they all tell each other stories. And they talk about what they did to each other. And that's the messy uncomfortable process by which people come to understand each other and we become able to move forward. And there's, you know, I mean, I think a book like yours is is part of the messy process of truth and reconciliation that comes out of the experience of slavery, America's um, great national shame. And there's so many, uh, I mean, it's hard to describe a book coming out of slavery as, as amazing, but, but there's so many books like that that are yeah. coming out now. There, there's Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. There's mm -hmm. uh, New Jim Crow, uh, uh, Between the World of Me, of, mm -hmm. of course, and, and uh, all these stories and people are reading them. And, and th that's pretty 
amazing. Well, I think what's interesting, though, is, is that, I mean, those are all amazing books. But, you know, one of the things that I'm always tracking is, are people reading essentially across tribal lines on these books? Mm -hmm. And the reality is that most of the books that you've just mentioned are fundamentally, they're pretty liberal books, right? They're, you know, and there are all these echo chambers that we have now. And fundamentally, you know, those are great books, but they're primarily going to be read by people who already sort of think, already think, think that, that. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think what's interesting about a book like yours or J.D. Vance's is that it's very hard to categorize. You know, it doesn't sort of fit neatly into either the liberal or the conservative narrative. And, you know, I think part of what therefore makes it interesting is, is that there isn't, I mean, especially, you know, in the middle of this particular election cycle, there's the possibility that a liberal reads it and a conservative reads it, and they have a potentially productive conversation <laughs> around it, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, those are the books that are sort of interesting because this book, I mean, you know, and always what, what you know, there, there was the question of, you know, what do you say at Rob's funeral? And essentially, that this book is in many ways an answer to that. And I think... Um, yeah, it's kind of a eulogy that got very out of hand. Well, but I mean, I think it's an appropriate eulogy in the sense that it, it says Rob as he was. You know, it doesn't it doesn't attempt to glorify him or demonize him. It just attempts to understand him. And the reality is that Rob was a complex guy and he was incredibly loyal. He was incredibly smart. He was incredibly funny. He had all these great qualities, but that he had this pull to this other life that came from, you know, his experiences growing up and things that he'd picked up. And there was this history that was trapped within him that was driving him unconsciously that he didn't even realize. Um, yeah, I'm I'm thinking of a moment. During the research, uh, again, the research took about three to four years. Uh, uh, again, hundreds of hours of mm -hmm. conversations with, with just awesome people. M most of them pretty awesome. Some not so much. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, but it was all sort of done under the the headline that Rob was a good person and he would never hurt anybody. Mm. Uh, that's the guy we all knew. Um, died in, in you know two minutes of. of utter chaos died violently um but but he himself w was just a really good guy and, and then i remember sort of late in the in the process uh uh ina who's, who's uh one of his uh girlfriends and very special relationship she called me um she was working in the pentagon at the, at the time and it was very late so uh, uh must have been it was late for me so it had to be late for her and, and she seemed kind of nervous and uh, we were talking, and uh, um, she said, like, she wanted to tell me something, but she wasn't sure. And, you, you know, I, I said, uh, it's it's uh, it's up to you. Um, it's your uh, your story, too. And that's when she told me that uh, Rob had briefly had this idea to sell guns. Mm. Um, and he sort of manipulated her into procuring some guns that he wanted to uh, take back to, to Newark. Um, and, uh, again, for such a smart guy, a lot of his... Uh, "Quote unquote business plans were, were really not not very um, well thought through or lucrative, um, and, and you know no record that he ever went through with it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, guns is a lot different from marijuana. Right? Um, guns, you know, their only utility is to is to hurt. Uh, and um, again, I, I don't believe he did. But what I took away with it from that is is how desperate a person had to have been to." Uh, you know, let his mind sort of spiral there. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that's the key thing is it's the spiral, right? I mean, you know, it's not that, you know, Rob ends up going down that road, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the point is, is that, you know, and then once you've gone a certain distance down the road, it becomes easier to go the next step and the next step and the next step. Mm -hmm. And then you can end up in a place that's totally different from what you would have originally intended. Yeah. And, and decisions that, that seem totally irrational mm -hmm. from the outside are typically completely rational to the person making those decisions. Right. And incrementally there, they make perfect sense. It's, it's the, you know, it's also, especially when you're for coming from the outside, it's like, I saw Rob five years ago and he was like this, he was, you know, graduating from Yale mm -hmm. and now five years later, he's selling guns, right? It's the, it's the, because you didn't see all of those steps along the way that the contrast is so stark. Yeah. And then that's sort of the, the titular tragedy that, uh, you know, is not just about Rob, that this is about, uh, uh, a lot of people, but, but you know, here's a guy who was just surrounded by dozens of people who wanted nothing more in the world than to just help him if, if he needed it, the way mm -hmm. he helped them. Um, but he, he wouldn't let them 
do that. Uh, he, he wouldn't even let them give the simplest kind of help, such as sitting down and listening. Right. Um, which, again, is, is a lot of what we've been talking about, just, just listening. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of people find themselves in that in that plight. Uh, you've been talking a lot about cultures and, and uh, masculine cultures. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a real uh, aversion. I mean, I'm, I'm a guy. Uh, it's an aversion to being vulnerable. And, right. And, uh, uh, you know, just saying what's going on. I mean, I bug my wife that, that she talks to her friends on the phone for two hours that she just saw two hours ago. Um, uh, and she says, Jeff, it's called catching up. <laughs> I'm like, well, what's that mean? I don't even know what that word means. <laughs> right. But, and again, like, yes, there, there are those sort of masculine cultures that we're also trapped in where we don't like to talk about emotions and where emotions are sort of dealing with your emotions are seen as a sign of vulnerability or weakness or, you know, and so the point is, is that again, like in terms of how we're talking about, you know, Western society and what it does well versus what it does poorly. Well, again, like, you know, this is, this is a real example of what happens when the things that the West does well go right. Rob goes to Yale. He, you know, a wealthy benefactor pays for his entire college, which is very generous. And not only that, he ends up with a degree in molecular biophysics or whatever they called it. Um, and But at the same time, at no point do his emotional his emotional baggage or his emotional issues get dealt with. They don't talk out, you know, how do you feel about your father, you know, either committing a double homicide or being accused of and ending up in jail for a double homicide. You know, how do you feel about white people? How do you feel about black people? These very basic conversations that are so emotionally uncomfortable for people that they never get had. And it's not that those issues, the elephant in the room doesn't go away just sits there and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, it, you know, breaks everything. And that's what I think happened to Rob. So, yeah, I'd say, I mean, personally, I would say, yes, his culture failed him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I think our culture and, you know, the, the whole point of the straight A conspiracy, the book that Katie and I wrote is the fact that, you know, human thinking is driven by emotions. That's the reality. That's what all the neuroscience says and all that sort of stuff. Just because it's scientific, that doesn't mean that people who claim to believe in science have adopted that reality. They continue to believe that people are rational individuals. And so they want to, you know, deal with education statistically, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is emotionally comfortable for them. It doesn't mean that it's reality or that it's effective. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm curious with all your work and your expertise uh, and what we've been talking about uh, on a practical level um, in schools, sort of what what do you think are, are, you know, realistic adjustments that, that could be made, uh, again, just to, you know, I'm not saying help people, quote, unquote, because help is a is another really tricky word, but but just to uh, reach people, I guess. Well, I think, I think that's the thing. Firstly, I think the most important thing is to come from a place of our shared humanity. We've always understood that, you know, what's going to connect us is our shared humanity and what's going to divide us is the culture that's laid on top of that. So, you know, in terms of our shared humanity, there are certain things that are universals. If you want to get better at things, you have to embrace and look at mistakes. That's how people progress. That's how people get better. That in general is not something that's done in American schools, right? Kids get a bad test grade. They wad it up. They throw it away. And, you know, I've worked with very wealthy white kids in Los Angeles, and I've worked with kids who are African-American and in the foster system. And guess what? doesn't matter if you're white or black. You have to look at your mistakes. And also in America in general, there's a tendency to avoid those because they're emotionally uncomfortable. And, you know, the reality is, is that that behavior, right, of wadding the test up and throwing it away is being driven by a very particular emotion, which is the emotion of shame. When we say, I feel stupid, stupid is a feeling. It's the feeling of worthlessness. Mm -hmm. And so what that ends up is that sets kids up to basically be in a pattern where they're repeatedly avoiding mistakes that can actually be very easily fixed. And so, you know, the number one thing is just to get kids to sit down and analyze their mistakes. Okay, why did you get number three wrong? Why did you get number four wrong? Oh, what can we do to prevent that? And essentially, that's what the FAA does. When a plane crashes, they look at the wreckage, they figure out why the crash happened, and they use that to improve. But inevitably, when you start doing this process, all sorts of feelings start coming up. Feelings of worthlessness and shame, things that teachers told them, things that parents told them, the fact that, oh, I think my older brother or older sister is the smart one and I don't feel smart. And or, you know, in the case of Rob, you would have whatever conflicted feelings there are there. And that's what we have to deal with. We have to sort through all those conflicts 
conflicted feelings. But we have to be, you know, I think very explicit that, you know, that there is something that is very uncomfortable going on here, which is that you belong to a tribe and tribes like all humans do and tribes have values and they protect their values and it becomes a question of belonging. And so there's the feeling as you are, you know, embracing and developing this new culture, you're inevitably going to run into feelings of betrayal or conflicted loyalties or anything like that. But again, that's an elephant in the room and you have to deal with that. And then the question is, okay, what are the values that serve your tribe in the modern age? And in the information age, there's no reason why any culture should not be embracing and analyzing mistakes. That need, that's one of those core human values like washing your hands after you go to the bathroom. Works for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you mentioned shame a few times and, and it just made me think uh, as a parent, more, mm -hmm. more than anything, I try to think all the time and to calibrate uh, the difference between shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. um, wh whereas, you know, shame is is really a, it's not it's not worth much. It's it's just a purely negative thing. Guilt is something you can work with. Well, uh, so the that also becomes like an interesting cultural question, right? So mm -hmm. all, we have all of these. Essentially, that's that's the level at which culture operates. We have this toolkit, this toolkit of emotions. So for example, the great achievement, you know, sort of culturally in the last few hundred years has been germ theory, right? We didn't used to do things like wash our hands and refrigerate our food and vaccinate our children and all that sort of stuff. And actually, some people have decided not to vaccinate their children, right? But in general, most people have gotten on board with the idea of germ theory and a lot of how that works is part of it is you know these beliefs but the other thing is emotional right so it's really hitching up to that feeling of disgust so you know when something's you know is has been sitting out for a little bit while you get that sort of like ooh, that's been kind of sitting you know it's that disgust feeling and what that does is it drives a good choice right i mean the number of times that i've left things out for a little bit too long and i'm like ugh, and there's this <laughs> conflict between my cheapness and, <laughs> and my desire to not get sick but ultimately yeah. the desire to not get sick wins out um, and my wife always says if you're smelling the milk in the first place that, yeah. <laughs> that probably means that uh, we could go spend two ninety nine. Yeah, and, rather than you know a thousand dollars, especially in the United States, on whatever it costs to fix that. Um, but so you know the 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 issue is actually, I mean, so we had a, a, a an author named Jennifer Jacquet on um, who wrote a book called "Is Shame Necessary: New Uses for an Old Tool," and the. Essentially, what came out of that conversation is, again, like you, having worked in an educational context, I'd always thought shame is just pure negative. It's bad. Like, mm -hmm. it's a terrible feeling. It, you know, screws up kids' choices academically. What good can be come of it? And her point is, is that in general, you know, there's always been this idea that Eastern cultures are shame-based cultures and Western cultures are guilt-based cultures. Um, but her point is, is that actually shame has vital social functions to play in the modern age. We just have to use it appropriately. So uh, the the example and this you know sent Brian's brain into like <laughs> you know overdrive because it's very difficult for him to handle. But the the basic idea was is that the the state states like California can't. Uh, I guess they can't take people who don't pay their taxes to court. That can happen at a federal level, but it can't happen at a state level. Um, and so the state of California, because they had these certain people who were ideologically committed to not paying taxes, they created this name and shame list where they would publish the names of the top 500 or 5,000 tax defectors. They didn't do anything except just put a na list online of their names. Um, and they shamed them. And the result was is that, you know, it's very cheap to put a list online. And if they don't collect taxes from these people, then they have to collect more taxes from you. And it's remarkably effective. Mm -hmm. You just shame them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there's a movement to do that with uh, high water users during mm -hmm. the, the drought. Uh, so I think the, the, the point is, is that shame is there for us as a tool. And then, you know, the, the conversation that Jennifer Jacquette is starting is when do we use it? How much do we use it? What are the appropriate uses for shame? Um, and there, there may be appropriate uses. And, you know, there are ways to design this better than others. They, they, in general, the state of California apparently sends out letters to people in advance, a month in advance or whatever it is, to let them know you're going to be on this list. So if you want to pay your taxes, now's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, I think it's just a question of what, what are those places. Um, but then the, there's the uh, – and uh, are, are we okay on time? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good. Uh, We're good. Okay. Um, such as the in Rob Peace's case, the the sort of unreachable 
mm -hmm. component. Um, I mean, specifically guilt and shame. I mean, when Rob went from uh, Orange to Yale, uh, great triumph. I, I know everyone was really jazzed about it. Big, mm -hmm. big parties. Um, but I mean, I, I know he carried a guilt, uh, you know, not just for his friends who. A lot of whom were very bright too, but couldn't go to college for financial right. or other reasons. Um, but also for his mother, who who was, uh, she cried every night for the first semester he mm -hmm. was away. She was alone in her home for the the first time since Rob was was born. Um, and again, I, I don't know what the balance well, there between guilt and shame is. Um, and then there's sort of like a mirror of that when when he leaves Yale and and decides to go home and and. You know, is watching college classmates become doctors and um, politicians, and and you know he's attuned to all those things. And uh, uh, you know, I, I think there's sort of a different kind of guilt slash shame with that transition. Um, well, I don't think I think that's the the, kid, the question is is the is the use of shame or guilt constructive, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say it's generally socially constructive to name and shame, you know, tax defectors so that they pay their taxes, so that their tax burden doesn't get passed on to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, the shame that causes students to avoid their mistakes or the shame that Rob felt at succeeding, that's not a, a constructive application of shame. So it's about how these emotions are applied. So to go back to disgust, the you know sort of constructive constructive use of disgust is us being disgusted by funny smelling milk, right? But the destructive use of disgust is essentially what leads to genocide. Um, it's when you find human beings disgusting. So in all of these genocides, you find that people, you know, there's this process, Jared Diamond, who we had on the show, um, told this great uh, story about, you know, these two tribes, they live in harmony next to each other in Papua New Guinea, and then suddenly resources get scarce. And so one of the tribes goes off and they start telling stories about this other tribe. And, you know, just before they'd all been best friends and all that sort of stuff. But they start making up these stories about each other. And with ha within half an hour, this tribe has convinced themselves that their neighbors are these vermin that need to be exterminated and removed from the land and all of that sort of stuff. And that's, you know, disgust. That's disgust at work. I mean, the Nazis in World War II, right, the Jews were constantly compared to rodents and vermin and all that sort of stuff. The Hutus and the Tutsis, the Hutus called the Tutsis in Yenzi, which is the local word for cockroach. So it's the same human mechanism of finding humans disgusting. So the issue isn't necessarily the emotion, it's where the emotion is applied, right? D is it good to find, you know, that milk that you have to question <laughs> disgusting? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it healthy to find your neighbor disgusting? No. Right. Is it good to, you know, shame tax defectors? Yes. Is it good to shame? Um, is it good to have shame around mistakes in school? No. So it's just a question of, yeah, where do you apply those emotions? And I would say, yes, yeah, certainly it's not helpful for Rob to be ashamed of, you know, you know, succeeding under difficult circumstances and getting into Yale. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is making me think of uh, sort of the racial tensions, uh, mm -hmm. sort of a. A uh, light way to phrase it that that have occurred at college campuses yep. over the past year. Um, Yale, for for one, that would mm -hmm. seem very uh, public, but um, a, a lot of ones you haven't heard of. And, and again, I've gotten to visit a lot of these schools. Uh, Cl Claremont McKenna, there, mm -hmm. there was an email situation. Uh, um, Colorado College, that there was one of those apps. Uh, I don't know, just people being idiots. But um, uh, you know, you. You've, I guess, in context of what you've been talking about, about tribes, I was very uh, sort of plugged into these things mm -hmm. as this sort of unlikely ambassador of of Rob, I guess. Um, so, you know, I was on the campuses having discussions with, with students, but then I'm sort of seeing how it's in the media and how people respond to it. Um, for instance, at, at Yale, a, a girl sort of uh, very loudly shaming a uh, professor who mm -hmm. uh, himself had uh, not been very sensitive. Um, but, uh, y you know, from sort of the outside that you see that on the news and it's viral video and, and it looks like these kids are whiners and, and they can't, they're just not equipped to sort of live in, in the, in the world mm -hmm. and safe spaces became a big deal. But, um, y you know, when you're there, uh, uh, again, talking quietly um, is helpful. Um, you know, most of these students are just 
trying to get through the the day to day, and they they care about the issues, and and they think it's a it's a it's a time to discuss. But um, college, especially, is so much about finding your the thing you're going to sort of pin your identity to, mm-hmm. um, whether whether it's sports or or, or, or frats or uh, uh, academics, whatever. Um, and, and you know, I found in each campus there's you know a small number of kids who've sort of pinned their identity to uh uh you know protesting which is social justice thing. warriors as they're known on uh, yeah, the internet uh, sjws and they, they they talk amazingly uh, about it and they've mm-hmm. thought through it all and and they're they're uh they're, they make sure that their voices are heard uh, mm-hmm. and then there's all these uh <laughs> these other students who uh you, you know maybe are are Involved just because of the the color of their skin, for instance, or or their roommates, uh, but uh, they they don't necessarily want to be involved, uh, um, and you know they just want to get their diploma and right. uh, find a job. Well, I mean, I think so. You know, uh, what's your well, what's what my take on that? that? Well, I think for the first thing, you know, I um, one of the best things that I've ever heard about humans came from a Ukrainian grandmother. And she said, you know, everywhere you go, people are nice, but governments are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is that if you look at any tribe, the majority of people, they just, you know, like they want a good life. They want to do all these things. You meet, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time in the Arab world. You go there. The majority of them are very nice. They feed you baklava. They, you know, give you delicious food. It's all great. But there's a small number of individuals in that society who are assholes, right? So, for example, in Libya, where my parents lived, 7 million Libyans, 7,000 Salafis, like fundamentalists. But 7,000 assholes can give an entire group a very, very bad name. Um, And, you know, the Arabs, the honor cultures generally understand this very well. So, for example, the United Arab Emirates had this big issue with all these wealthy kids who would go off and they would buy sports cars and they would race around London and, you know, rack up all these like amazing traffic fines uh, or kill people and then ultimately, you know, just flee back to the UAE. And they realized that the small number of individuals was giving the whole of the UAE a bad reputation. So they instituted a simple law, which is that if you misbehave, if you c- c- collect a traffic violation anywhere in the world, it will be prosecuted in the UAE, right? Because they have to defend their reputation. Like we obviously in an African-American context, we talk about like having a rep to protect and people generally assume it's bad, but reputation matters. And the the basic problem that you're talking about is that if you go to these college campuses, most of these kids are you know, fairly decent, normal, decent people. But there's a small number of people who have taken on this role of social justice warrior who give the entire... And, the, and their antagonists as, as well. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they've given essentially the whole group a bad name, right? Or they've, they've sort of painted the whole group with that brush. Um, but, you know, there's also the bigger sort of issue of what is that whole social justice thing about? And, you know, it's fundamentally there's a, you know, humans clearly have some sort of modality in them that I call the invasion of the body snatchers, um, <laughs> which is that, you know, when our values get under threat, right, and we feel that we're being challenged, we have a tendency to, like, do that horrible thing at the end of the invasion body snatchers where it's like, ah! <laughs> Uh, that's but, the best thing I've ever heard. Yeah. But, you know, there's like, there's a lot of invasion of the body snatchers going on right now. Islamic fundamentalism is a form of that, where essentially there is a group of people who are freaked out. And so, you know, they're doing that. And, you know, people just do it. It's this attempt to sort of purify your own culture. And in an Islamic context, that means sort of returning to the Quran and, you know, sort of really purifying any outside elements in the religion and the most extreme and the best version that I've ever had. Like the kite runner talks about like, oh, there were no kites in the Quran. Oh, there was no toothpaste in the Quran. So we can't use these things. These are Western contaminations. But my favorite one is, you know, my dad, when he was in um, Libya, you know, there was a, there was this Sufi mosque. And the, the, basically the deal is with these Sufi mosques is there's some deal where essentially the dead are, you know, buried. Uh, there's some deal with the dead being in the mosque or something like that, which is different from Sunni and Shia. And essentially the Salafis feel that somehow this is like worshiping the dead or there's, you know, somehow offends their sensibilities in some way. So there's a group of Salafis, Muslim fundamentalists who are going to go in and destroy this mosque. And this friend of my dad's, this Libyan guy goes over and stands outside the mosque just to essentially try and talk these young kids, young men down from doing this. 
And, you know, the Salafi, the young Salafi guy is like, well, you know, we have to do it, you know, because, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know if you know about what's been happening. The Americans, they've in Guantanamo, they've been like imprisoning all these people and torturing them and all the things in Guantanamo. And he's like, wait a minute, are you talking about Guantanamo? And the guy goes, la, la, la. No, no, no. It's Guantanamo because in the time of the prophet, there was no guh sound. That is a Western contamination. <laughs> So they've stripped that out. And, you know, what these social justice warriors are doing is the same thing. You know, there's a real focus on just sort of removing all contaminating elements and all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, they're being driven by a psychology that doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of buildings around Yale that were paid for by slave owners. but uh, Named after them. Too. Yeah. yeah. But the question is, do you remove the names of the buildings paid for by slave owners or do you uh, or, or do you actually leave them up as a reminder? I think, you know, we wouldn't say that in the wake of the Holocaust that, you know, yes, there's all this shameful past of the Holocaust. Let's tear down all the concentration camps and, you know, <laughs> remove any of that sort of stuff. I think it's much healthier to, you know, keep it there and be like, hey, guys, just so that we remember, this is a valuable reminder. Um, yeah, I, I've been, a. Uh, I think this is, uh, obliquely relevant. I've been spending a lot of time at this, uh, uh, really cool charter school in, in Compton, mm -hmm. um, called Enmo Pep Brown, um, sort of a project I'm working on about just what it's, what it looks like and feels like to be, uh, a senior in high school in, in different spaces right now. Um, but so at, at this school, it's hundred percent Latino, very, all, all local, mm -hmm. uh, kids. And I was very interested in talking about, uh, the election and, and Trump, mm -hmm. um, and I uh, anticipated like a very deep upset to some things he said, and, and some of these guys are undocumented at the school. Um, and uh, you know, when it came up, they they were just laughing and laughing uh, and laughing uh, about you know uh, all of it. It was totally the opposite of of what I. I anticipated would be like a very mm -hmm. somber uh, sort of meditation on, on being marginalized in, mm -hmm. in, in America. So, uh, well, and that's I also really astonished. At. That's also how you, you know, rob the emperor of his power, right? Like if everybody laughs at Trump, then Trump loses his power. You, and that's why it's so good that we have, ladies and gentlemen, guess who just walked into the room? The funniest man alive, Brian Callen, a man who consistently shows that the emperor has no clothes. Um, and by the emperor, I mean him, because he walks around naked. I was, wor I was working as an actor, ladies and gentlemen. My apologies, <laughs> but I am here at the last minute. Wait a minute, Brian. Was it a cable show or was it network? Is in like a massive I reach? Only, I do both. I do network. Oh, network. Jesus, yeah, Brian. Do and do you, do you like to, when you do shows, do you like to sell them out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah for me, I only, I'll be honest with you guys, I only play to sold out crowds. And <laughs> that's just the way I am. And anyone else, I blame China for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I think uh, America should be grabbed by its collective pussy. <laughs> there I said it. And if you disagree with me, go fuck yourself. <laughs> well, uh, I'm so glad you joined us. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talk about elevating the conversation. <laughs> um, okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I am getting the buzzer light to say that our time is up. Jeff, this was awesome. We oh, love man, thank you so much. Yeah, man. we would love to have you back on anytime you want. I mean, maybe you'll even get the privilege of talking directly to Brian Callen. I know I live up the street, so <laughs> just give me a five-minute warning. Yeah. Um, but so the book is The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace, a brilliant young man who left Newark for the Ivy League by Jeff Hobbs. And uh, yeah, I mean, what's to say? It's a brilliant book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a great read. But um, fundamentally, I think, yes, the thing that is, I think, so encouraging about this book is, is that it does not fit easily within either liberal or conservative narrative. The only narrative that it fits easily within is a human narrative. It cuts down to that core humanity. So thank you uh, so much, Jeff. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not the New York Times, but. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, though. Yeah. Um, and uh, Brian, anything you want to say? Um, yes, I think people like you make a difference because you put a human face on things and on people uh, we wouldn't normally meet. And there's this tendency to think that those people over there suffer and live differently than we do. And so uh, I think you did a good job of proving otherwise. Yep. That's, I hope you guys wrote all that down. <laughs> 
Um, all right. Thanks so much, guys. Talk to you soon. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye. 